Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Data Diversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss building a data strategy, practical steps for aligning with business goals, sponsored today by Digital Realty and Monte Carlo. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to Dan for a brief word from our first sponsor, Digital Realty. Dan, hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon, and uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, my name is Dan Eline. I'm the Senior Director of Platform Planning and Solutions at Digital Realty. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are a company that sits in the infrastructure side, uh, primarily uh, in the data center industry. And so you might be wondering, what do we care about data? Well, actually, uh, data has a really real impact on our business, right? It's kind of the data in data center means that the more data you all are worried about harnessing and generating, capturing, generating new, tends to sit in facilities like ours. So we're very fascinated with the concept of data, and, and we do a lot of time you know, talking with our customers, talking with folks like yourselves in the industry, and studying what's going on. Um, we're constantly reading about what's going on, right? So the growth of data, looking at, you know, sort of between 2010 and 25, the data has compound annual growth rate of 535%. Well, you know, that's something for us to think about. Where are we going to house all that data? What are people doing with all of that data? To that end, we've actually, we put together in uh, 2022, something that we called the Global Data Insight Survey. And we went out um, and talked to just about you know, almost 7,500 participants. And um, we asked them 13 questions. And these folks sat across nine industries in 23 countries. And they were companies sized between 100 million and a billion dollars. And we said, you know, what is kind of important to you? What are you thinking about data? What do you see happening in this world of data? And so, you know, the kind of the highlights, the things that, that I thought really stood out to me that I wanted to share with everybody here, and I suspect you're probably in agreement or you wouldn't be attending a session like this, but right, data first strategies are, are important to everybody, right? 76% of the respondents plan to use data to improve customer experiences and build new digital products, right? So it's the concept of taking data that sometimes we already have laying around and creating kind of an industry or a new product around it the distribution of data is increasing. So whether it's because we're, you know, regionalizing or we're globalizing, um, you know, growth of business, regulatory demands, trying to solve for application performance issues, right? That data is getting distributed. It's, it's all over the place, right? Um, you know, localization is the other side of that coin. There are times when we need to have copies of data resident, whether it's because we're, you know, bound by particular regulatory concerns, whether we have an application, um, stack or, or workflow that requires the data to be in a specific, you know, distance to user, distance to application to perform well. And, and you know, that's driven by latency, right? So we keep a big eye on latency and obviously, um, you know, distance is the largest effector of latency. And, you know, so there needs to be a meeting place. Where can all that data sit globally? And, you know, so for us, that being the business that we're in, we say, well, all right, Let's, you know, let's think about what that means. So when we think about that meeting place for data, we say, well, where does it need to be? That leads us to another study we do. As I said, we're, we're, we're big into kind of researching and, and thinking about what it all means. We put together something that we call the Data Gravity Index. And we've uh, released two editions so far. We have another edition coming out here shortly. But the, the point of the Data Gravity Index is to take this concept data gravity, which was coined by Dave McCrory, who now works with us at Digital Realty. And he says, you know, data has this, there's, there's kind of mass, right? And, and there's a, a draw that it creates. So gravity is a great analogy for this. And we said, well, that's, you know, awesome, Dave. Can you help us predict where that's going to be? And that's exactly what the data gravity index is about. 
It talks about where we see the, the largest growth, right? Where are these centers of data? And in the, the forthcoming release, you know, we're going to talk a lot about the relationships between these locations and, and look at the splits across industries, et cetera, because it's not only going to inform us about where we need to build these data centers, but we hope it'll help inform you, you know, when you think about how you address your business. And because as much fun as problem admiration is, we also want to be part of the solution. And so we take our platform digital, as we call it, our portfolio of data centers and services, and we say, like, we use those to create a meeting place. And, and we encourage folks like yourselves to use that as a meeting place, because part of your data strategy needs to think about how do I get the data where I need it to be? How do I host the applications and services where I need them to be to support what the workflows are that are important to me? And so, you know, in the short time I have today, I just want to let you know, you know, we have this out there. I would encourage you to come and take a look around our website, take, grab a copy of the data gravity index and take a look at, um, you know, what it might mean for you and your business. So thanks everybody for enjoying, uh, for joining today and do enjoy the uh, show. I'll be around at the end for questions. And thank you so much for kicking us off. And for um, and if you have questions for about Dan or about digital realty, you may submit the questions in the Q&A portion of your screen as he'll be joining us in the Q&A at the end of the webinar today. And now let me turn it over to uh, Shane for a brief word from our second sponsor, Monte Carlo. Shane, hello and welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. <clears throat> um, and it's great to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, briefly Monte Carlo's uh, data observability platform. Um, uh, I'll start with uh, just super high level. So uh, introduction to me, um, I'm the field CTO of Monte Carlo. Prior to this, I was the head of data at the New York Times, where I spent uh, most of the past decade um, and oversaw a group of about 150 people in that data organization. Uh, Monte Carlo, though, the, the role I've been in for the last uh, eight or so months, um, we're essentially building trust and reliability in an organization's data in order to drive the adoption and value from, from data products within those organizations. Um, and we are the, the creators of what's called the data observability category. Um, and you can see there are a number of, of customers we have. Um, I'll explain more. I'll, I'll kind of first outline the problem we solve, and then I'll explain what observability is and does. So we, we start with this concept of data downtime, um, which maybe uh, you aren't familiar with the name, but I'm, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with what it is. Um, data downtime is periods of time when your data is partial, erroneous, missing, or otherwise inaccurate. Um, and, you know, I certainly as a data leader saw this across any number of, of kind of data products or data assets we were managing for the organization, both kind of machine learning products that had to be available up to the second and we used to drive the revenue of the business um, or, you know, more kind of BI and reporting products that were made available to finance or to the newsroom or to product teams that um, maybe didn't need to be as timely, but needed to be accurate and, and consistent. Um, and really the problem we see with data downtime is that the data producers, the software engineers that are, are owning the source systems can't see downstream, can't see who's affected by, by changes that they're making to their systems. The data consumers or the analysts and data scientists can't see upstream. They don't know where the problem is occurring. And very often the data engineers or the data platform teams are stuck in the middle trying to, to predict all the ways that data will break. Typically, this has been solved with um, manual testing approaches. And what we've found is that manual testing really only covers, you know, 10% of the, the types of um, data reliability problems a, a team can run into at scale. Um, this is sort of predicting the percentage of nulls you should have, that sort of thing. And, and invariably what happens is your downstream consumers are still finding the issues, telling you on Slack that they've found them and, and alerting you to the problem. Um, this, I'll, I'll be super quick, this can range from trivial to existential. 
Um, we see data teams have about 70 high severity incidents every year uh, across per 100, uh, 1,000 tables, I should say. And about 30 to 50% of data engineering time is spent on fire drills. So how does, how does Monte Carlo look at this? The benefit or the, the um, good thing we've found is that data downtime looks quite similar across companies. You're asking these questions, is the data up to date? Is it in the right size? Is it complete? Um, you know, all, all these sort of questions around schema, around shape of data and around the quality of data. And so what we did is create these five pillars of observability, which are freshness, volume, quality, schema, and lineage. Um, and those are the things that, that Monte Carlo uses as its foundation to um, understand uh, through metadata, through logs, through metrics, um, the nature of the specific data products that are quite variable um, across a, a, a kind of scaled data environment. And then so, so what in fact is data observability? It's actually using this, this capture, the, the logs, the metadata, and the, the metrics around your data um, to de detect, resolve, and prevent uh, data incidents at scale. Um, and so the things this comprises is on the detection side, we have, for example, machine learning powered anomaly detection uh, on things like freshness incidents, volume and schema changes. Um, we also have ML powered uh, uh, anomaly detection on things like quality and distribution of data. Um, and then in the resolution side, we provide the tools to understand the impact radius of a data incident, understand the field level lineage so you can trace back upstream um, where the incident occurred and also provide all the context necessarily to quickly resolve an issue. Um, and finally, there's tools we have in the prevention bucket, which is really about getting ahead of, of data incidents in the first place. Um, through things like circuit breakers. Uh, and I will stop there and, and hand over. Shane, thank you so much for this great presentation. Again, if you have questions for Shane, he will be joining us in the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. So feel free to put them in the Q&A portion of your screen there. And now let me introduce the speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. With that, let me give the floor to Donna to begin her presentation. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to do these each month and then see some familiar names in the in the list of, of attendees. And thanks for the sponsors for those helpful overviews. Um, if this is your first time at a Dataversity event or, or this particular series, I just want to call out that this is a series. Um, you know, this is interest to you. There's a lot of other great topics. Um, or if you missed some in the past that look interesting, like on some of the emerging trends in architecture, all of these are recorded um, on the Dataversity site. Uh, so you can always catch these later. So hopefully you can join some of these other titles as well. But why are we here today? Um, data strategy is definitely a hot, hot topic. Um, some of the you know points that the speakers earlier brought up as well, um, and it's in our name is the the company that I, I work for. So um, you know have a lot of experience with that. But I think one of the biggest things that we hear with a strategy is that it just seems overwhelming. Like I think you know everyone, which is a great thing if we're in data, that more and more businesses are understanding that data is important. But then, you know, how do I how do I really make that a strategic asset, and and where do I start? That's probably the biggest thing. So as with all of these webinars, you know, data can get really complicated really quickly. And what I try to provide is is real world simplified templates and and and, and experience for having done this in the real world um, that can maybe help you get started. Of course, we can't cover everything because the strategy is big. But hopefully, this this webinar will give you just a few points to think of. If it's just one thing you go away with that you hadn't thought of before, I feel like I've, I've done my job. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, unless you've been living under a rock, in which case I'm jealous in this current world, <laughs> you can maybe hide. Uh, you have certainly heard about this idea of the data-driven business. And what I like about this particular slide is either all business, you know, um, magazines or, or you know 
issues, you know, Forbes, Harvard Business Review, Wall Street Journal, they're all talking about data. And even the CIO Journal is talking about data-driven business, not just tech, right? So I think, you know, th that that's a great place to be if you're in data. We're the sexiest job of the 21st century, right? If you haven't heard that quote. Um, so that's a great place to be. And if you are a data professional who is looking to more have that business perspective and literally have a seat at the table, table I think this is a great place for you. And I think that's where data strategy comes in. Um, you might have heard me say this on, on previous um, webinars, but you know, my first my first degree was in economics, and I thought I was going to go and be this great, you know, business leader and all of that. And then I found data super interesting, and felt like I sort of had to choose. And now you don't anymore, right? Because so much of if business is data driven. I guess in a lot of ways it always has been, but and more and more new business opportunities are driven from data. And, uh, and you know, we at our company work with a lot of. C-level folks, a lot of business folks, and, and I know that they are, and we can often fill that gap, but we need more folks at the table to really help them understand the complexities of data, but in a very simplified business-centric way, um, you know, because this can get complex. So how do we flip the script a little bit more, talking about data architecture and data management, and really make it more of a data strategy? And that's what we'll talk about in this um, session. It'll be a little less techy than than some of them because that really gets down to this. What are we talking about when we're, I get this question all the time. So I, I try to get a lot of the questions that I'm asked all the time and put them in some slides for folks. Um, you know, what's the difference between a data strategy and data management? Haven't we been doing data management or data architecture for a long time? I don't get the difference. And, and so I went back to uh, just the dictionary is probably the best way, just the meaning of those words. So if you look at strategy, it's plans towards a goal or achieving evolutionary success and, you know, again, a big visionary type words and, and management, you know, the judicious means to accomplish an end, or I hate this definition, but it's the act of managing, isn't that self-describing, um, or conducting or supervising something, right? So yeah, yes, that's the managing day-to-day, -day, but what makes it strategic is that business vision. We have goals, we have drivers, and a day management is a part of a strategy, but just like anything else, am I just, you know, managing my finances or do I have a strategic goal for my retirement, right? That, that's almost the, the basic definition of the word is really how to think of a data strategy versus data management. And I think um, for folks on the call who are technical or maybe data architects, kind of putting your business hat on when you do a strategy, I think is a key part of that. Of course, there's a technical aspect in the platforms and all that, but the, the so what um, is a big part of um, why we're doing this. The other question I get a lot, and, and I can kind of relate to this, but what is it? Like my, my boss just said, I had to build a data strategy. Like what's the deliverable? Like, do I write a document? Is it a, um, you know, a PowerPoint? Is it a, I sort of joke about interpretive dance, but um, I actually had a client that I was getting her master's in data science and, and at one of their, the, um, the deliverables at the end, you could either write um, you know, your summary uh, of, of your, or you could do it in a poem or a dance. And I kind of laughed, but she was doing a lot of statistics on social science and homelessness and things like that. And I think what they were trying to get them to do is, do you understand the people and the, and the, you know, the issues around the data? It isn't just numbers as human beings. And she actually wrote a wonderful poem that brought a tear to my eye about her data. And then I think in a way that's kind of a, maybe a slightly facetious example, but that's what makes your data strategy sing or dance as well. Like, do I have the business um, view of this? That said, if you do have this deliverable, I am a bit biased and I always say, put it in a PowerPoint. That may not be your only deliverable, but the nice thing about a PowerPoint is consumable and, and do it like you're going to, to present to an exec. If you can't say it in 20 slides, um, you know, it's not going to be enough really helps you crystallize um, your uh, your vision. Um, I, I just, we've come in too many times with strategies that are, are well thought out, but it's like a 50 page document and, and it's on the shelf and no one looks at it. You know, that may be a deliverable you need. I know a lot of government agencies, a lot of universities do publish kind of their five-year strategy and it's in a document that's been thought through. You just don't start there, right? You need to kind of sell this. And, and part of your job is always marketing, right? You need to really make it, um, you know, understandable. And that's hopefully what this webinar will help you do. You know, you're back to data really driving the economy. Um, you know, this one was passed to me actually from a, a client a little while ago. And I, I really like it because this is the World Economic Forum, right? This isn't data diversity. This isn't DEMA. This isn't data people saying the data is important. This is the World Economic Forum saying it. Um, what they're saying, you know, seems like a long time ago, but really wasn't. Just in 2013, when you look at the companies that with the highest market cap, they sold things or their focus was things, you know, Walmart, Exxon. And, and in 2028, it, really the focus is data. And yes, 
Um, Amazon's still there, but when you think of it, you know, they sell things, and so, but but it, they're very data driven. Their recommendation engines are focused on data. Alphabet, Google, Microsoft, you know, they are data companies and they're saying that actually today's economy, data is the valuable asset, not so much the tangible physical objects. So I found that really interesting um, and something to think about when we're thinking of data strategy. Um, another thing I like to kind of the balance when we're talking about a data strategy, and neither one of these is right nor wrong, but just think of your organization. There's a difference between business optimization and being a data-driven company and business transformation or being a, a data company. Now, now, what's the difference? I would say in, in optimization, it's kind of doing what you do, but do it better. And, and you could argue, hey, we've been doing this for centuries with data, you know, um, that, that, you know, how would we be more efficient by either, you know, removing manual efforts to either manage data or, or business, you know, processes that are inefficient because, you know, I don't have the right data or can we understand our customer enough to have better marketing campaigns or, you know, understand our product usage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, many companies are now where data is the product or monetizing your product or or even within your company is an entirely new business model. We're going digital and data is the business. You know, think of an Uber or yes, is, a, is it a taxi company or is it a data company? Right. And, and I'm, I am working with several companies that, um, you know, and maybe even to, to mitigate some risk of a recession or, or if your industry is up and down. Is there data that you can monetize within your organization or new business models driven through digital or data that you can think of? And again, Maybe it's both. Maybe you're trying to optimize your business or transform your business, but you know, kind of different ways of thinking about it, which makes again me excited about being in data because you you understand that you know if you're doing a, a data strategy, it should be driven by your business strategy. It's not done in a vacuum. That's what makes it a strategy and not data management. But more and more, what I find exciting, and that data can drive your business strategy, right? What data do we have? What data can we optimize? How can we you know do more things with data to drive our business? So how do we turn that into a strategy? This is the framework we use, and you may have seen it in other presentations. Um, what I like about this, and we've gotten some good feedback, is just sort of almost a checklist of the things we need to do. So definitely from the top down, what's our business? How does that align with data and vice versa? How do they feed into each other? But also from the bottom up, what are we talking about? Is it everything in a relational database? Is it big data streaming, documents, content? You know, there's a lot of things. And then moving up the stack from how do we secure it, integrate it, the metadata around it to you know, how are the, maybe more leveraging that for strategic advantage? Do we have BI and analytics or machine learning? Is the quality of good, good you know, source? Do we have a single view of our customer or, or patients or students through master data management, right? All of those are important as well. And then the key glue, I think, that level two that kind of links the business with the tech is the data governance. And I'm, I'm a big fan of calling it governance and collaboration, right? Because that's really the way to collaborate between IT or, or tech and the business to really make this a business focused event. Do you need to do all these things in the nth level of detail all at once? Absolutely not. And that's another part of a strategy that I, and we'll talk about it towards the end, which is a roadmap for execution, right? A, a strategy might seem theoretical, but it's absolutely not. What makes a successful strategy is that roadmap for execution and then re-strategize. Um, you know, uh, another question the, is, you know, how long should this take? They should be fairly short and sharp so you can get if you're doing strategy for too long, you know, it shouldn't be a year strategy together, right? You know, make it a month, two months, three months, um, and then move on and start to, you know, tweak it over time, um, but really get, get to the meat of things. Um, the other thing to think of, and again, I'm, I'm throwing a lot out here in a fairly quick period of time, but again, if you just have a few things that help you tweak what you're doing and maybe frame what you're doing, then I've, I've succeeded in this webinar. But, you know, are you offensive focused, you know, on is it creativity and profitability or is it more on, you know, defense? Um, and, and and think about, and there's probably a, or a combination of both, kind of that purple middle. But when you think about, because at the end of the day, you're going to be selling your strategy, right? Um, you know, are you a very compliance driven organization, maybe insurance, or you've just had a fine or, you know, it's healthcare. And, and it really is more, we have to reduce our risk, you know, aspect and we, we don't want to be there. Or are you a brand new startup and and it's all about, you know, growing the profitability and customer satisfaction. You know, is that the messaging or is it somewhere in the middle? But, you know, I, I've not that I've ever made a mistake, but if I had, you know, it's it's kind of thinking of your audience or even within your company, maybe how you sell to legal or finance might be different than how you sell this or explain this strategy to sales who might be more on the offense side. Right. So something to think about is kind of that theme or the message of your strategy overall. 
And then with, whichever ones are probably a combination, I would argue that almost every company has some aspect of that purple, right? You're a bit offensive, a bit defense. It's just more kind of the, the level. Um, what are those quick wins or the levers that you can, where data can be that fulcrum, right? Because there's a lot you can do and you want to do a lot of things quickly over time that build rather than wait for that one year. You know, we're not going to give you anything into a year, right? So there's a lot of data you could manage. Is there a new marketing campaign that's coming up and we can get better customer data or location data or whatever? But, you know, I had a boss that always used to say, you know, are you rearranging the deck tears in the Titanic? <laughs> like, you know, there's a lot of things we could do. And I think, and again, this, you know, may be obvious, but when you're thinking of a strategy, you know, what are those quick wins that are going to drive ROI and really drive business value towards the end? And when you think of what ROI or return on investment might be, there's a lot of several ways to look at that. There's a lot of things you could do. I've found that over time, generally, they fall into these four buckets. And probably having something from each of these buckets as you're trying to make your case is probably valuable. So I would argue sometimes the easiest thing to quantify at the end of the day, because you know, you're going to have to prove that your strategy has some value or, or why else are we doing this, right? Um, decreasing costs. There's always so much wasted effort. And, you know, Shane talked about that in the beginning of, you know, how, if, we're not, if we're not checking our data ahead of time, you're going to be cleaning it up later. And how much effort does that take to, you know, fix things? Or are your business processes inefficient because you don't have the right data at the right time um, and, and data quality and issues like that? That's a sort of an easier one to quantify because time or money or, where there, you know, wasted mailing sent to people at the wrong address. You know, some of those are really easier to quantify. But also think of the revenue, the stick, you know, the carrot. <laughs> We're not just always the stick, right? Can we have better pricing through analytics or marketing, better marketing campaigns, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Or, you know, this isn't always about a for-profit. We've got some customers, you know, how can we write better grants by understanding who our constituents are for our nonprofit, right? But sometimes a little harder to quantify, you know, we'll so much we could talk about, but you know, having champions for your effort. One of our strategies, we actually had marketing come with us to the presentation to the CEO and say, you know, we will commit to driving revenue by 10% if you can help us get a customer master data system because we can do a better understanding of customer. A little bit rare that someone's going to stand up to that level of accountability, but they needed it. They knew they need, and I, you'll probably find those champions in your business or, you know, maybe again, to a nonprofit. We can't write these grants if we don't know, you know, who we're serving or whatever it is. Try to think of that increasing revenue. Also, the risk. Don't always love to drive with risk, um, you know, but we have GDPR, HIPAA, you know, FERPA, all the, you know, other, other regulations, but not just regulations, right? Is it, you know, I'm a product company. I don't have the right product information, you know, food, I'm a food product and I don't have the right, you know, allergens on the website. I could get sued or, or do we just, you know, kind of to the one on the right. Do we look bad? <laughs> How many, you know, have everyone got this email of, you know, dear insert customer name here, you know, uh, you're a valued customer or spelling someone's name wrong or, you know, a breach, heaven forbid, right? So, so much more. And, and then social media, people do have a voice to say things. So, you know, maybe, you know, making this mistake with data, you know, worst case, I spell the, the our highest, you know, most loyal customer's name wrong in an email, you know, then maybe they're not going to leave your company or maybe you're not going to get sued or maybe, but it doesn't look great. Right. And so much is up uh, hosting on reputation and brand brand trust. Right. Um, I'm a bank and, you know, they don't have my, my name, right. Or my account number, right. I start to lose much. Should I be putting my money in this bank? Right? So, you know, just think of those things, those different categories. Also, and this one is often forgotten is the risk of doing nothing. So I don't, you know, almost every company has that inertia. We've been doing this for 20 years. And, you know, what, why do something different? Often we come in with a company right where that, that kind of that scaling point, you know, it might be a million, a multi-billion dollar company and they've been doing well. But in order to get to that next level, you really have to be investing in data management to get that next level. And that's often kind of hard to explain to an exec. Well, you tell me I don't know how to run my business. I've been successful. Yes, you have. But think of the risk of doing nothing and include that in your ROI analysis you know, doing nothing has its own risk as well. This next slide, and, and I'm, I'll be jumping around across a lot of things because the data strategy does, <laughs> it's a big part of it. Um, and I will be pull, pulling off some some of the research that I'm a, also uh, kind of like Dan, a fan of, of statistics and numbers <laughs> and proving the case, uh, data person, right? Uh, but we do surveys with Dataversity, uh, Global Data Strategy Partners with Dataversity each year and I, I love to reach back to these because this was a, a nice one I saw in, in 2020 when you're looking at the big things folks are looking to implement in the next few years which is now it's data strategy data architecture and data governance 
And I am not surprised at that at all, because to me, those are almost the three pillars of success. A data strategy can't be successful without the data architecture, which is the key to make things drive. You know, if data strategy sort of sets the business vision and the, the roadmap for execution, think of your architecture as that technical foundation and your governance is the people, process and culture part of it. Um, yes, there's also a technical aspect of governance. I'm, uh, that's not lost to me either, but I think those are kind of the three pillars and I'll kind of touch on that in the rest of the session of how all of those really fit together. And if you're missing one, it's gonna make your, your, you know, your strategy a little bit weaker. Um, this is a framework we use for uh, governance. And again, it, it really kind of naturally ties into the idea of a strategy. If you don't have a good vision or, or strategy for why you're doing governance, it's going to be really hard uh, to, to move ahead or, or that culture and communication. We'll talk a lot about that in this session around it. You're not going to have uh, success. You know, everyone has the what's in it for me. You know, why am I doing this? And, and, and you know, why does it matter? That's a valid question. If we can't answer why we're doing this, we shouldn't be. And that's really a part of a strategy is tying it, you know, intrinsically with the, the drivers of the business. A lot of that's people. A lot of that's process. Data management is close to all of us. And tools, of course. You know, it's hard to do data lineage, as, as Shane mentioned. You know, and be doing that one by hand, right? But that shouldn't be where your strategy starts. You know, what are you doing for a data strategy? Well, we're going to buy a data lineage tool. Yes, you might, but then you got to frame it in the right way. What, what are we doing? Why are we doing? Who's doing it? How's it going to affect things? And then one of the means to an end will be a tool to, to do that. Um, another thing to think about when you're building a data governance, I'm kind of in this first pillar here with an organizational um, framework, is how you organize your data governance structure. And it really should match that culture because they're driving that business. And think, and, and the one on the right um, is, is one method of, of kind of developing a data governance framework where you may have a, you know, exec leadership, they're really going to be driving your strategy and the steering committee are really going to be developing that plan. Often your strategy is kind of driven by the steering committee as well as the execs, but also kind of the, you know, in the weeds governance committee, doing the definitions, work groups, et cetera. It's a very common way to kind of put things together, but not the only way. Are you a more federated company? Are you more agile? Are you more driven you know, in different ways? And maybe you don't need all these committees. Maybe you need one, or maybe you need just some working groups to begin. That's another way we've seen that can either make a make a strategy sing because governance is so intrinsic to the way of working and the way your company runs that you almost don't, you know, it's just it's just part of the DNA of the company. Um, or it feels forced. You know, maybe this is too hierarchical and it's just not going to work with this company. We need something else. Then you know, it's really intrinsic to how you, as an org on the left. You know, do you have, do you understand your org structure? Do you understand the business capabilities and how we apply that to data stewardship? Um, it's not just something to think of. And again, this can and will be a whole webinar, but just, again, one of those touch points to think of as you're building out the strategy. Um, and then data architecture, as I mentioned, if you think of those pillars across, you know, governance and architecture and strategy, I, I, I a big part of that is the data sources and what platforms to use. I guess I wouldn't lead with that, right? What is your data strategy? We're moving to the cloud. That's not a strategy. That's a tactic. <laughs> it's one of the things to do, right? I do like to look at this, though, because that is a big part of the decision. How and what tools do we use? Um, again, this is, comes from that data diversity survey we mentioned. Um, still, although everyone loves to, to talk about its demise, <laughs> and I will argue with that person, the relational database still is sort of king. Um, where most companies either have a relational or on-prem. Uh, what keeps me up at night is that spreadsheets is up there. Uh, spreadsheets are fine. They're not an enterprise data management tool. Uh, but you'll see that there are a lot of other choices in the market as well, which, which leads us to the next slide. Um, what are people looking to do in the future in terms of their data and their data strategy? Again, relational does not go away, um, but you will see that it's much more cloud-focused. And I think um, this idea of including um, a data lake as well as this, whether it's a data lake house or um, another part of the survey was, you know, one of the questions was, do you use a data warehouse? Do you use a data lake, a data warehouse only, data lake only, or a combination lake and warehouse? And the order was absolutely combination of both, then data warehouse and data lake by itself was just very not common because there's a lot of folks know that they have their value, but to really get the you know, a lot of those business value out of it, you have to kind of transform that lake into, into something else. So 
that said, what I also like about this slide is that, yes, you'll see the, I mean, relational databases are great for what they do. I don't think they'll go away because they have referential integrity. They're good for data quality, right? Um, but where you saw that that was kind of a peak before, it's an and condition, right? That people can use relational databases and other things like graph databases, real-time streaming, and, you know, key value, but non-relational and they're excellent, right? But you don't want a graph of garbage, right? Graph databases are great, but you have to ensure that, you know, some of these core data quality and things are done as well. So I'm heartened by this, that there's a lot of choices and it is something you definitely should think of in your strategy of, you know, maybe we're not gonna throw away re relational databases. They definitely have their place, but should we be adding to that? Are we not looking at some of these new technologies that could offer us value? Should we be looking more real time? I mean, if we're using data to drive the business, should it be more real time? The business runs in real time, you know? Or do we need a graph to really understand kind of that knowledge graph of the org? You know, there's a lot of things you could be using and something to think about as you do develop your forward roadmap. Are we missing something? Are we not looking at some of these newer technologies, you know, or machine learning or AI and things like that? But really when you're looking at, you know, kind of this idea of a data strategy and all of the things we're building that we could talk a whole webinar on each, metadata, quality, governance, privacy, security. The idea is to get these trusted data sets, right? And all of the things around your strategy are, yes, the sexy stuff and yes, new analytics, but that can't be done unless you have this idea of those trusted data. And it takes, takes a village really <laughs> to start making that, which is the, again, not only the strategy of the why and what do we prioritize, the data architecture around it and then the data governance. And it's kind of the the, what do you call it, the synergy of all of those is what makes trusted data sets and then what do we prioritize along the way. One way I'm, I'm a big fan of, of doing things, again, I mean, I, I, I understand it and I'm, I'm old enough to have been through some of these phases of, you know, architecture sometimes seems onerous, like, are you going to make me do, you know, an entire enterprise logical data model before I can move ahead and is it going to take a year? No, I think the idea of of picking these targeted business values as part of your roadmap what are those quick wins but that doesn't mean a quick fix right what what's the minimum viable product for architecture we can do to solve a business problem and then you're going to get the buy-in you're going to start building things in a much more excuse me agile way but you're not skipping the hard stuff right um so pick a problem you know this was a, a kind of a fictitious insurance company it might be any of these you know how do we best price our policies how do we support our brokers how do we support our customers you know pick a problem and then build the models around it again that's what makes it more strategic and less just architecture what's the business data model around our pricing and what what can we include in pricing or not what's the business process for understanding the you know is it online pricing do we have to go through uh you know any actuaries and things like that you know, what's the data architecture for this problem? What are the business rules and glossary around it? What's the data quality for this focused area? You know, rather than, and, and you know, maybe this is obvious, we don't boil the ocean and look at every piece of data in the organization to the nth level for a data quality dashboard. That's part of the prioritization and strategy. What's going to, you know, and you may have several dashboards or views, right? What's our customer data quality for this area, right? And you're really getting those targeted wins along the way that'll build to something more enterprise but that's you know re really target it and tell the story around it it's always kind of my my best advice here um and then how do you turn all that into a roadmap and again that can be really overwhelming because there is a lot of stuff so one one thing is that what are those chunks what are those quick wins we can turn into a warehouse and then I mean, a warehouse into a roadmap um and then the classic who what where why when how and what so, you know, the why is a bit, don't, if you, if you skip anything, don't skip the why, uh, because you really get, you know, what, what, why are we doing this is a valid question. And is it offense, is it defense? How do you message it? We talked about that. Who, not only who are the stakeholders who will benefit, eventually you're going to have to keep selling this. And then who are the data stewards? You know, often they're kind of discovered in the org because you probably have champions of this effort that you can get back to the how. How will you organize your governance, your architecture, all of that? And then the what, the what is huge of like, what are those quick wins? How do we build out the full roadmap, but in small wins? You know, is it customer data, then product data, or, um, you know, different analytics use cases, et cetera. And then the when, how do you roll this out? And there's a bit of a magic sauce there. Um, of, of How do you roll it out? What's the timing? And then what other initiatives either are gonna, are gonna get a, in a way of this if people are busy with other things, or can you, champion with, you know, there's a new digital transformation for our supply chain. Can we support them with our strategy and get the supply chain data? Excellent. Move on, right? So that's a win-win. 
you're helping the org, you get some visibility, or is it a marketing campaign or a new product launch or whatever? And, and sometimes that's just a hard switch. And having lived this, you're in the weeds of tech and you just need to get the stuff done and, and just put on your business hat and be like, okay, what, if I were the CEO and what, what are their strategies? Or, I mean, what's their goal? And how is data become an integral part of that? It's just flipping the script again a little bit and, and making sure it's become strategic and not just data management, if that makes sense. So how do we build a roadmap? That's almost the trickiest part um, sometimes of this. Again, align with the organizational vision. You want to be, you know, I, I, I sort of joke, we're all human. And at the end of the day, you're, you're, you know, venting about work. How come this other project is all the funding? Everyone cares about what they do. We're doing way better work than they are, you know? Well, answer that question. Why are, are they probably? I don't think their project is inherently better or worse. It's probably more aligned with the organization's vision. You know, maybe they're driving a new sales campaign or the new, you know, student, you know, enrollment campaign or, or whatever it is. And so, do make an effort, especially if you're on the tech side. You know, have you read your company's annual report? If your public company is generally out there, um, and, and often those are very clearly defined, what the vision is, what the goals are, and then think, okay, so how can whatever project I'm doing whether it's analytics or MI or ML or glossary or anything, um, how does that support that? And, you know, there's a lot of ways, or do we listen when we hear the company updates? Is it just, you know, Snoopy's or, you know, Charlie Brown's <laughs> mom, gonna mom, mom, or are you really listening and ingesting and thinking, okay, how does this drive what I need to do? Um, and then also think there's so much to, to get this right. Uh, also, what what is a quick win for your org? And, you, you know, is it, Cautious is a quick win. Ooh, maybe within six months we can start something, or is a quick win? You know, you're a startup and it's you know a sprint cycle. You know, you really need to kind of understand that. Um, and what do you need to plan? Because again, people have a day job. It's the beginning of semester start. You're trying to get all the faculty together to do a data governance launch. You know, maybe that's not the best timing, and maybe that's obvious. But sometimes again, you're in your weeds. Um, just remember, you know, people are in their other weeds, and <laughs> how can you help them? Um. And then, yeah, the, you're supposed to, uh, sorry. Uh, so the other part is is explaining the vision. So what I was sort of headed on that last slide is that rocket ship, right? How do you be part of the rocket ship moving yourself ahead? Um, in a way, you know, a big part of the story is building that story because it's going to take many steps. And, you know, the analogy is maybe, you know, we're trying to climb Everest. And yes, that's an exciting thing, and it's exciting, and, and we'll have a great success at the end, and we all want to do it. But you know, people die along the way. Right? It's, a, it's a hard thing. So how do you? And not only that, is it takes a long time. So in, unless you continually build that excitement, you know, people that are in base camp and they've been stuck in the tent for three days and they haven't eaten, and they're going to start to wonder why the heck am I doing that? And that'll happen. When you whatever it is, you might not be starving in a tent, but it might be that you know. The, the data quality isn't as great as we want. We can't get the analytics until that's done or, you know, wh whatever. There's, but you have to continually have that excitement. So people not only are bought into the vision because the, the so what is a big deal. Um, what's in it for me? It should be the question. But then how does everybody fit in? Does, does the finance analyst or, you know, accounts receivable clerk really understand why they need to be a steward and why this business rule is going to help what we're trying to do, right? So, so a bit of it is explaining what their role is, right? I might not understand why I'm carrying this heavy pack, but it's because you, you've got the food for the trip to go to Everest, right? You, you, everyone only has a piece of the role, so it's hard to see the full journey. And that is you as a champion for your strategy really need to kind of keep that moving. It is, it is partly a marketing effort. Um, the other thing is the idea of your organizational maturity. So back to that analogy, I might be climbing Everest. Great, am I already a mountaineer? And I've got my core team and we're just ready to run. Or have I been sitting on the couch for six months and I don't even know how to climb and I, I need to really start? And neither both folks can get to the goal. Um, you need to understand that and then really understand it by discipline because not everybody's pointed in the right direction. Um, and it doesn't, it's not necessarily your answer, right? So the one in the middle is where you are today. The one on the right is where you aspire to be. And maybe not everything is as important as everything else. Maybe for this company, um, you know, data warehousing is more important than, you um, you know, the, the metadata management or, or the data integration, or, you know, maybe we don't need analytics, we just need BI right now, right? right. And then where you are today, it doesn't mean you always fill the gap. It might be that you play to your strengths. You know, that's the, that's the bit of the subjectiveness. You know, do we start with a thing we're already great at and get people really bought in? Or maybe we can't, we're great at analytics, but we're terrible at data quality. We really, let, let's get the data quality fixed 
when we publish the analytics because they're going to be wrong, right? That's kind of the, the cost benefit, but you, you need to understand where you are before you can see where you want to go. And there's plenty of maturity assessments out there um, you can use or you can kind of do your own. This is ours that we use, um, you know, with kind of those areas of the framework that we, we talked about. But in any case, just think, you know, it could be a finger in the wind or you could have an external person come and do this for you. This kind of benefits to both um, to get an objective view as well. And then from that, again, that, that isn't the answer. That's one of the other inputs. There's a lot of inputs. And then what are these quick wins? You know, how do we, knowing that the full strategy might take years, you know, think of a strategy, you might look at your company strategy or a government strategy. Generally, it's the strategy 2030 or the strategy 2050, right? Strategies by definition, long term, but if you don't see those efforts along the way, you know, your team on Everest is going to give up and go home because they don't see why I have to do all this hard work to get to the peak. It's, you don't always see that full vision. So do these small wins, you know, take pictures of each base camp or whatever, killing my analogy, uh, and then deliver a quick value kind of over time. Um, what is a quick win, right? It is worth kind of thinking that through. So what it's going to solve something high value. It's going to be a proof of concept, but also have a foundation for future efforts. It's not, a, I'll, I'll talk about that in a future slide. Still do it right. Back to that architecture slide, still do data models, still do a glossary, still, you know, do the, the right things, but do it in a quick way. The idea is to get that light bulb moment for folks that maybe didn't get data or didn't understand how they fit into a data strategy. So that's a big, big piece of it. Um, and this is my, my slight rant. I'm holding back on rants today, but um, a quick win is not a quick fix. Um, and I, you know, often, you know, folks don't like that, that idea of, okay, it's going to be quick. It's another POC that's going to be crap or we'll end up putting it in production. And that's not the right thing. A quick win for a strategy is again, it's a building block towards that full foundation. It's not the duct tape on the wall. It's again, back to that slide I had with building, building it the right way, understanding the vision, understanding the business drivers, picking the right subset of data, understanding quality and the architecture and all of that, get success there and then move on. So you're building you know, the house with a good solid foundation and not a bunch of just random stuff. That That's some of the why it's a strategy. You think you do this strategically. Um, another way to look at this, um, we're a big fan of doing a lot of this stuff, whether it's an architecture or, you know, brainstorming, you know, through, through workshops. You can get a lot through some of these collaborative workshops. And this is one uh, we use all the time, a priority grid. I found out after I did this that Boston Consulting Group tries to call it the Boston grid, but I don't know. It's sort of obvious we all come up with that, whatever, give it to them. Um, but, but again, like of all the things you need to do, even, and I've had a lot of good success with it, just sticky note it, right? We need to do a customer MDM. That's going to be high benefit, but it's also really hard. Is that where we start? Or is there maybe something that's high benefit, maybe not as hard doing some address validation for customers? Maybe those are steps along the way. Maybe it's a business process change that has to happen. Maybe that's somewhere in the middle. And I have folks kind of self-select. And people start to realize, you know, because you might have someone saying, we need customer MDM or we can't do everything. Well, maybe that's too hard. Maybe we do start there because that's the hardest bit, but people are kind of collaboratively seeing it. Or, you know, it, it, do we need to migrate all the legacy stuff now? Does that have the same amount of benefit or, or whatever, right? So it's a good way to kind of, again, that finger in the wind of where do we start? What's going to take longer? How do we get there along the way? In kind of a collaborative workshop -y type environment. Um, I do... I want to kind of stress that I see a lot of these when I see, you know, we often come in to kind of clean up a roadmap of a roadmap that I mean, I'm sorry, a strategy that maybe didn't feel strategic. And I just want to say a strategy and a, and, a, and a roadmap shouldn't just be a laundry list of things, right? That you should have some sort of theme. Again, if I'm going to go climb Everest, it's going to be hard. We, I don't just get this thing of, you know, pack your bag and, and train and, and do all these things, get your oxygen. It, it, there has to be some theme of the why. Um, and, and really, it's each level kind of explain why folks are doing things. So definitely do have a roadmap. Understand the staffing and training around that as well across all of the areas. Maybe governance is going to go at one pace, analytics and master data are going to go through another. And do we have the right people to really support this effort? That's going to be a big part of it. Um, oops, sorry. But that's a part of it of kind of how we roll it out. But a big part, and I, I do want to touch on this, but then I'll also give some time for questions. Um, if, and, and I guess I, I didn't always include this in my strategy presentations, and now I always do. Uh, the more I understand about this idea of culture and organizational change management, 
that's probably what's going to make or break your strategy. Yes, you have to have the vision. Yes, you have to have a great plan. Um, you know, I have to tie it into business benefit. But if it's just me and not everyone else is in for the ride, it's not going to be successful no matter how good it is. And if you can look at Peter Drucker, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, you know, don't love that because I like to say I'm a strategist, but he's right. Yeah, you really have to have everyone else around it. So, you know, I was, you know, it's been just, you know, the past several years for me that have really understood organizational change management. And once I'm bought in, I'm fully bought in, we add into all of our projects, right? This is not change management like tech change management, like your, you know, database change management. This is how you change the culture of an org. And, and we've found where we might come in or even on one of our own projects where it seems to be lagging after a few years, like what's wrong? We've got the warehouse, we've got analytics, and we, we've got governance, but there's something missing. It's generally this organizational change. How do we change the culture so that everyone's going to be data-driven? They're actually going to use those reports and make data-driven decisions. Think of it just like anything else has its own roadmap and journey. Um, again, we tend to, as the tech folks, go right into kind of knowledge, right? We've got this new thing. I'm going to train you on data governance or train you on master data management or and that's uh, folks aren't necessarily there yet right even the awareness what is it what is even this new thing being what is data driven what is it and and what's in it for me and then sometimes they start to get the momentum oh everyone's talking about it and joe brought analytics to his meeting and, and made his case through analytics maybe i should do that too right and then how do i get trained and then and then reinforcement those success stories joe joe made a decision based on data we didn't have, and it really helped the ROI of the company. Wow, we need more of those dashboards, right? And then it becomes this wave, um, but it's a planned wave, right? It doesn't magically happen. You have to plan those quick wins in the ROI, you do change management, but we often jump right into training. This is how you use the dashboard. This is how you do data governance, but do we go backwards, you know, get then back to that motivation as well. Um, a lot of slides here you can kind of go through and kind of look through. But what's interesting is change happens at many levels. It might start with the organization. I mean, ah, I can talk today. The individual, right? The person who's sitting at their desk going, what's in it for me? Valid question. And, and, and change rolls up into a project. That might be your first quick win. Wow, that project was successful. Or how can how we get the right people involved? And then it goes and, and branches out to the organization. And you really need in your plans to look at all all levels and i would add into this um you know yourself is one of those individuals where are you on the change of journey across all of this right um think of your own motivations too as well um good way to think of that um and then marketing part of your job is marketing it shouldn't be technical jargon it should be business jargon we're going to help drive the organization we're going to get better students have healthier patients you know better community whatever it is through data and then, you know, don't be shy, do the swag, do the posters, do the, you know, more, you know, but make it very business centric because it's, again, that's the why it's a strategy and not data management. Another thing you will get resistance. Again, the most motivated person trying to climb Everest is going to be tired halfway up, right? And there's going to be times, even yourself, <laughs> right? What, what, why is there resistance to change? Um, and then just think through and like anything, plan it out. What are some of the root causes? You know, is it, They've been through this before and they're jaded is that they're busy is that they don't understand it right and do it at each level from the folks you know hands to keyboard to the execs to middle management and out and then proactively go against that resistance plan and think about it everyone's human no one's like critically negative against you but you're asking people to most likely start to do things differently what are going to be those big rocks or little rocks that you want to have to and get ahead of that because um, that can make or break your strategy so um, that I just wanted to bring in that change management aspect because that, that again, it's really going to be a key indicator and, and, you know, we'd love to have time to discuss them, but that's not the format of this, but something to just take away yourself and maybe think of when you're launching your data strategy, what do you think the biggest fear of change might be in involving that? And then what might excite people? And it's probably both. You definitely want to start pointing towards the green and start to avoid some of the red. But that might be just something, you know, later when you're brushing your teeth and thinking through your plan for a strategy, what's going to get people jazzed about this? And what might people be nervous about for valid reasons? And then start to address them in your plan. So, again, data strategy is all about the business and about the data. That's what makes it tricky. You know, it's governance, it's architecture, and then get that proper roadmap. So you're doing those quick wins. So everyone understands where you're going. And don't forget to bring the culture and the org along for the ride. So I will pass it over to uh, Janice, uh, Janice, <laughs> Janice for questions.
um, little plug for next month's um, March webinar on data mesh, uh, kind of demystifying some of that. Uh, a shameless plug that we do strategies for a living. It's in our name. So if you need help with any of this, don't hesitate to reach out. So with that, Shannon, I will open it up to Q&A. Donna, thank you so much for this great presentation. And if you have any questions for Donna, feel free to put them in the Q&A portion of the screen. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides, the recording, anything else requested. Uh, so, you know, we've got a few minutes here diving in. And uh, Dan and Shane, welcome you to join back in. So, Donna, can you talk a little bit about uh, mesh and fabric and where that fits in? Oh dear, here we go. That brought up last week too. I will, I will, I will keep it quick um, because we have a whole session next month on data mesh. I think that's one of your both architectural choices when you think of. Remember that slide I had where the strategy. What, well, four pillars, right? There's a strategy. What do we want to do? What's the right architecture? Is it more, you know, um, maybe virtualized or federated or more centralized? It ties into your governance. Um, because, you know, is it a top-down governance? Is it a more federated governance? And I promised a fourth. It's also kind of the theme, you know, theme of, of what, what your strategy is and, and how you your culture, you know, is it more you know, you mesh? <laughs> Do people have more, you know, individual responsibility? Is it more centralized? So I, I'll, I'll leave it there because I know we have a whole session next month, but I'll open it up to the other speakers as well and get their thoughts. Oh, yeah, I'll just come in. Uh, I see a lot of customers implementing data mesh at the moment. Um, and typically, uh, you know, it starts with the four principles, uh, domain oriented ownership of data, uh, moving towards a self serve data platform. And Monte Carlo is often part of that self service platform to instill trust and reliability in the data. And then thinking of data as a product, and finally, federated computational governance. Um, but it is really a way to decentralize the ability to build and manage and distribute kind of data products at scale across an organization. Um, data fabric, to my understanding, is, is a, an architectural appro approach that's applied to, to standardize data across clouds. So it's more of a, a technical architecture. anything you want to add you're muted if you're no i think that pretty much covers it i love it so i mean continuing on here uh are data flows and data lineage meaning the same thing how detailed the data flow should a data flow diagram be for example column level schema level or database level um, I'll, I'll take that a little, little granular for architecture, but I think it ties, I mean, for strategy, but I think it ties in with, I, I think there's at every level, like at the strategy level, you know, I think a big way to show is, is both your current state and, and future state. So understanding at a very high level, how data flows across the organization, what the value is to me, that's almost a solution architecture level. At some point you, there's a, almost like your source to target mapping type level that it can go down to the column and that's more your, your data lineage. I think that's definitely important and part of the implementation, but I, I think at the strategy level, I would keep it up at more at that much, you know, high, higher level, but in terms of the implementation, that that's when you're going to get down into those detailed data flows and data lineage. Yeah, I, plus one to that. Yeah, go ahead. I, I would say the same, right? I think, you know, one of the things um, we look out for, obviously, in my line of work, uh, we have kind of, we're you know, as much the consumers, right? We're looking into a lot of the same things, I think, as the folks that, that Shane and Donna are helping are. But, you know, one of the things we do caution people is like, as you're out, right, doing it, don't, it, it's a it's the balancing act between depth and breadth. Um, and I think just one of the things I, I would point out, a lesson learned for us has been, you know, go as far as as you can but when you find that certain areas are, are making, it, you're having better results, right, in one particular domain than another, look at that as potentially a flag. Um, it, it, you know, it, as, I, as Donna said, at the strategy level, it's not so important to have depth. But if you find that you can't get a reasonable level of depth across all 
kind of the domains you might want to be looking at, consider why that is. Um, one of the things I think is interesting is, is it's almost never really technical. Um, my experience has been it's almost always organizational. So, um, and, I, and I think you covered that really, Donna, right, is the, the concept of the, the organization hiding things inadvertently, right? Um, and, and hopefully everybody who's here is well on the path to being part of the solution for that. Um, you know, obviously data mesh is an interesting concept because the belief is that right, there's some democratization of data there. But I think again, just getting, asking folks you might not normally ask around your organization tends to shine light on, on um, you know, things um, because right, a lot of data flows Right. Well, not a lot. All data flows stem from workflows, and workflows themselves stem typically from business processes, right? So communication, simple things like that can, can really cause you grief. Well, the perfect timing. We are right out of the top of the hour. I'm afraid there's so many great questions we didn't have time to get to, but thanks to all our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. And thanks to Digital Realty and to uh, Monte Carlo for sponsoring today's webinar to help make these webinars happen. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with this, for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thanks, everybody. Hope you all have a great day. Shan Shane and Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Donna, thanks as always. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.